when KitchenAid reached out to me and asked me to do this demo, I was actually super excited because I think I'm using a piece of equipment that they have been selling for years, but I don't think anyone's ever demoed, is what everyone's told me. Um, it's really, really a special thing that they make. It is called the vegetable strainer, and you probably would have never heard of it or seen it unless you came to like the Home and Houseware show. But what's really cool about it is, if you ever seen like a potato ricer, um, where it's like small little grated holes in stainless steel, um, what's useful about it is you turn the machine on, and it can puree any sort of vegetable or fruit that you put through it, and it pushes out all the skins and seeds and gives you a very clean puree, which usually, to do that, you have to buy like a giant piece of equipment um, that costs a lot of money, but you can make like your own jarred tomato sauce in your house super easily. Just cut up a bunch of tomatoes, throw them through the vegetable strainer, season it, jar it, and you can have a beautiful like marinara in the winter time from your summer's garden tomatoes. Um, so what I'm gonna do first is kind of show you how to assemble it. Really not that complicated, um, but it's pretty cool. So it's the grinder base, the original attachment, and you just kind of screw that in. And then you've got a couple of different components that if you've ever seen anyone use a KitchenAid grinder, they're very similar, but they have a slightly different setup. So you've got the driver, and there's a spring on it. The side that has the spring on it, you want to push to the front, slide it in, and then there's the, uh, I don't know what this is called, but the spiral part. <laughs> and then the actual strainer, it's got a little part that clicks in, and you can see it, it's the spring loaded. And then it's just a matter of tightening it up on there. And so before I put the, uh, the housing of it on, you can see this is the part where that internal spiral is going to push all the juice and the puree from our peppers out. And out of this front, there's a little hole. And that's where all of the things that are too hard to go through the grate are going to push out, so seeds and stems. Um, and then they've got this great little housing that helps you keep it separated and a lid so that you don't splash yourself with hot peppers. And out of the back will come the puree, and out of the front will do the seeds. Um, so that piece of equipment I've been using um, in restaurants for about four years now and it is an absolute workhorse with the KitchenAid. I make like 30 quarts, so about eight gallons of harissa at a time, and you just like run the machine through. And what we used to have to do is like puree them in a food processor and then like scrape out all the seeds, and it was like super labor intensive. So I love this piece of equipment. Um, the recipe is pretty simple. It's got three different types of chilies that are dried. You can find a lot of these in most supermarkets or like an international market that might sell Indian or Middle Eastern goods or um, like uh, um, Latin American supermarket, like one of the Cermax. Um, uh, and so we've got ancho chilies, which are smoky. Um, these are guajillos, which are kind of like a balancing chili. They're spicy but they still have like pyrazine, which is like a vegetal flavor, like the pure green pepper flavor. And then these are chili de arbol, um, sometimes known as japones as well. But these are the tiny little guys that are super spicy. You get like the red chili pepper flakes from. And then the rest of the components I've got right here, it's a lot of spices um, because uh, um, like we were talking about before the demo started, I like to balance heat with spice. Those are two different things. They're two different flavor profiles. So uh, these three guys right here, this is caraway, coriander, and cumin. And when I'm teaching cooks about North African cuisines, 
I'm always referring to the three C's of North Africa, which are these guys. Um, and the balance of them and a lot of their uh, pilafs and couscouses and meat braising and all that, they're always kind of evident. So I kind of use those as a backdrop all the time. Um, some Aleppo chili flakes, which are named after the town of Aleppo in Syria. Uh, most stuff is coming from Turkey these days or Egypt. Paprika, tomato paste, garlic, and then lemon juice and white vinegar or white wine vinegar. And that adds the acidity. So we've got spicy, smoky, hot, acidic, um, and like all that together gives you like a very balanced hot sauce. I think there's a difference between spicy hot sauce like Tabasco or Louisiana or Crystal, which I love because I lived in New Orleans for a while, and like something that you can kind of use on a lot of different things where you could use a, a good amount and it's not going to like kill your taste buds. So the first step to making the harissa is, and it's, they're spicy chilies, so it's always a good idea to wear gloves, is you're going to have like a, a big mixing bowl and you're going to take your chilies and it's best to use um, like a large metal bowl or you can just keep it in the pot. But you want to bring a pot of, of water up to a boil. And then you're going to pour the hot water over the dried chilies. And you can do a couple of things. Um, you can kind of see here they're kind of floating a little bit. Is there a, oh, you got the little mirror. Cool. So they're kind of floating. So what's good to do sometimes is like if you have like a pot lid you can throw on top and fit in the bowl, or like really convenient is just to kind of throw a dish towel, and then when you're done with it, it'll soak up the water and kind of weigh them down so they'll, they'll keep hydrating. The whole point is to rehydrate the peppers so they get that juiciness back so when you put it in the machine, they're like nice and pureed. Um, and once you're done with the towel, you can just like wring it out, run it out of the sink, throw it in the washing machine. It's not going to ruin your towel at all. Um, so we would let these sit for, you know, about an hour, maybe more. Um, we have some that are already ready that are over here. And um, for the three types of chilies, You've got the gojillo, and you can kind of see they're much moister now. They have a flexibility. They're not like crackery. Um, but, and, the, uh, and the little uh, chili darable. The anchos, which are those big smoked ones, the stems don't really go great through the machine. They're a little too hearty. So I like to rip them off. But I don't try and like shake out the seeds or anything, because they're going to come out just fine. Um, and then the uh, before we grind those, what I'm going to do is kind of start to set up the rest of the harissa so we can just kind of move through it really quickly. Just gotta grab a towel. So for me personally, unless I'm using spices that I'm like, know that they're coming directly from the source within like a few months, a lot of the times I like to kind of lightly toast them. Um, when you're talking about aromatics, it's really important to like apply heat to them in some capacity because that brings out the smell. So that when you actually put it into something else, that smell will end up like infusing into something and turn into flavor. So like that's like a trick that I always do even at home. I'll just like throw some spices in a pan, or um, if I'm like sautéing some vegetables and I throw spices in, I'll actually like let those spices kind of like toast in the pan with like the onions and garlic or whatever it is so that those vegetables pick up more on that flavor. So what we're going to do is we're going to throw a little bit of the caraway, the coriander, and the cumin in that pan and just kind of like move them around. It's like warm. They're going to like start to smell a little bit, and you might see a little bit of browning on them. It's OK. You just want to kind of move that pan around fairly often. And then what we're going to do is we're going to bring over a lot of these ingredients over to this uh, KitchenAid blender. 
Um, what I'm going to do is pour in lemon juice, some vinegar, and our garlic and Aleppo. And just to kind of make sure that um, the garlic puree is really nicely in there, I'm just going to crush it with the blade of the side of the blade of my knife. Um, and then once these are nice and uh, toasty and you can smell them, you can kind of just go right into that blender. And they're warm, and they're going to kind of absorb into that lemon juice. And then make sure you keep the dial on zero before you turn it on, all right? Um, start it up. Really let it, like, puree, like, finely. Um, it's also easier if you like do the spices first and grind those up fine. For like what I'm doing now, the blender's a little big, so I wasn't sure if I was gonna get it. But I like to also use like a spice grinder. Um, but for this purpose, like it's totally okay to throw it in there. You just need to let it go for a little while longer. pretty good. Um, so the lemon and the garlic, normally when we make, when you make something with like lemon and garlic, you might, it might ferment over time. What's great about the harissa recipe is um, for the lemon and garlic, they kind of like are going to get mixed in with all these other spices, tomato paste, the pepper puree, and then a ton of canola oil. And that's going to like keep it preserved. So this stuff can last for like two weeks in your fridge. Um, so you can make a good amount of it and then just kind of hang on to it. Um, you might end up going through a lot faster than that. It's pretty good. Let's see how that looks. Cool. Um, so we're going to hang on to that for a little bit. I'm going to show you guys how to use the vegetable mill. So you don't want to turn it up um, past like four because it'll try and work too hard. It'll have a lot of resistance. Always remember your gloves. And it's, uh, KitchenAid gives you these handy dandy pushers. Um, you're going to have a little bit of residual water from the soaking. So these have been drained off. And like some of the peppers will have extra water. It's totally OK. It's not going to really dilute your, uh, your harissa that much. Can you guys see inside of it? You can see. So that's like all the pepper puree. And then you'll see this coming out the front. That's all the seeds and stems. So when I was uh, when I was a chef de cuisine at Shia in New Orleans, we were making this a ton, and um, like our cooks were spending countless hours, like making all this sarisa, and we were just flying through it. And so I was looking at like, I was looking at like professional, like industrial vegetable mills for making like pasta sauce, and they were like in the thousands. And then I like just happened to stumble upon one of these in like a like a home goods store in New Orleans, and I was like, "Thank God I didn't order like the like three thousand dollar." As uh, like we've never burned one out. We've never, you know, people lose pieces, then you got to buy another one. But never breaks for just for this purpose at least. I don't know. Maybe if you're grinding like chickpeas in there or something, it's gonna not work. Um, so you can see it's just this like pure raw pepper puree coming out.
Easy enough, right? So we're going to let it like do its thing for a little bit longer, um, just because it's still kind of pushing them through. And then what's going to happen is I'm going to take off that housing unit once all the seeds are out and kind of like scrape off everything off of that grading attachment to make sure I get every last bit, because this is the good stuff. I want to try and like get as much out of those peppers as possible. Uh, yeah, so I also set it up where I have these two bowls. Uh, you want to like have a much bigger bowl for your seeds and stems than you do for your sauce, because you don't want to get this stuff in here, because then you got to kind of like search through it and get it out. Because this is like this texturally is like very unappealing when you're trying to like put this on like chicken or fish or anything like that. Oops. So that is all that harissa, pure pepper puree. And this is the base for our actual harissa that we're going to finish making. So I like to get like a pretty big bowl to mix it, because you're going to end up adding a lot of stuff to it. Um, so all that puree. A little bit of smoked paprika. I tend to use paprika with peppers a lot, even if it's spicy chilies, because I like to add that, like intensify that pure pepper flavor. Um, and also it's like fairly indicative of North African food. And then we're gonna get all of our, uh, our puree from over here. Scrape out as much as possible. Get all that good stuff out of there. And then start to kind of just mix it up a little bit. And it hasn't looked like it's changed too, too much, right? Um, the big component to this to kind of give it a balance is tomato paste, which is an extremely versatile ingredient, I think. It has a lot of like great sweetness and like raw quality to it. I like to put tomato paste in like almost everything. Um, but what this does is instead of adding sugar, it's like concentrated sweet tomato product. And so, and it ties into the peppers really nicely. And it gives it like a nice balance. Uh, a hefty amount of salt. Cool. Um, I also, at this stage, like to use a whisk. I just want to make sure everything is like really, really uniform and combined. And so we've got garlic, hot chilies, all the spices, all the acid from the lemon and the vinegar, which is going to help preserve it. And then we're going to top it off with like a ton of canola oil. So you saw how like thick and pasty it is. You want to get this to like a broken-ish stage, you know, like not like the like vinaigrettes you see in like big restaurants where it's like super smooth and shiny. This should never really be like one combined liquid. It should always be kind of broken. Um, and what that does is it helps keep it preserved. Um, but what this, this sauce doesn't have without the canola oil is fat. And fat's super important. We're not talking about like putting butter on all your dishes. I cook with a lot of olive oil. Olive oil is a little too strong for harissa, I think. So I like to use a, just a clean canola or vegetable. But that kind of rounds it out and gives it like an unctuous body when you're like eating it. 
so that it's like really, really like something you want to keep eating. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I'm probably going to use the whole bottle here. We're going to use the whole bottle. <laughs> Am I being too nerdy for you guys? Am I being, no? We're cool? I'm like a huge nerd. So I'm just like really geeking out about all this cool Israeli North African stuff. Um, yeah, so this is this like super great consistency. In the restaurant, we like to put it in squirt bottles. We just like cover everything in harissa. Uh, when people eat or are eating like family meal, it's like our hot sauce. Like we don't buy hot sauce. We just we make so much harissa, we use it. Um, you could take this, um, like, add it to mayonnaise, put it on a sandwich. It's like a spicy, you know, like people do like chipotle mayo, harissa mayo. It's next level. Um, or rub it on chicken, throw it on the grill. Rub it on fish, um, like serve it uh, on chicken wings, throw that on the grill. Harissa, melted butter, tossed with chicken wings, throw it in the oven. That's a fantastic game day meal. And no one's gonna, no one's gonna see it coming. I mean, like, I thought these were just spicy, not well seasoned. Um, so that's the harissa, and that is really not that complicated. All you really need is that vegetable mill. Um, you can do that and make like barbecue sauces um, instead of using like dried spices, buy like ancho chilies, add a bunch of mustard, some brown sugar, or molasses, kind of do the same thing. I think the technique applies to a lot of different cuisines, um, but super versatile tool, I love using it. Uh, next up, we're gonna make shakshuka. How many of you guys have ever heard of shakshuka? Raise your hands. You never had my shakshuka, right? Um, so I am like really crazy about certain foods that I cook, like overly intense. I think like I've tried to get down to like what the heart of some of this stuff is. Uh, you see a lot of shakshukas where it's like kind of runny, tomato-y. That's fine. The way I've had it in Israel, in like people's houses, is it's almost like a tomato custard. Like you reduce the tomato so far down. So we're gonna get this pan super hot, scorching hot. Can I get some uh, canola oil? Um, uh, for me, the base is like very much like an Italian pepernata. I like to use spicier chilies than like bell peppers. Um, just to kind of like bring that heat level in immediately. So I've got a yellow onion, a couple cloves of garlic, and some Anaheim peppers. Um, banana peppers, Anaheims, um, what else do they sell here? Hatch chilies, all like super easy to use. Um, and then cherry tomatoes, something I always have lying around in my house. Like this is all stuff I pretty much have all the time. Um, just for a random, so like on a Saturday morning, I'll wake up, saute some vegetables, tomato sauce, eggs, call it a day. Uh, for me, I kind of like to cut these vegetables like pretty casually. I'm not that particular. It's more of like a thickness thing. We're not trying to do small things. So it's, you know, nothing like too thick, too thin, quarter inch. Um, and it's really more or less just so that we can have, once these vegetables kind of saute up, they still have a lot of texture. Because what you want to really have is like a bite in there besides the tomatoes. So it's like the same thing with an onion is, I like to cut, you guys see that? I cut in half, the stem's still on, and then cut in half again so that I get these nice little like half moons, right? Mm. 
the beauty of a lot of this stuff is in the restaurant, we can be super particular about cut sizes and all that, but, but like at home, I don't care. I'm just like making food for my family, right? So um, yeah, but like this kind of thickness is great. So that pan, I can already like feel it is like smoking up over there, right? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add the cherry tomatoes. And one of my favorite things to do with cherry tomatoes is just like blister them, like blacken them, like get the juice popping right out of them and get some of that caramelization. This is one of those dishes where we're really building flavor in one pan. It's super convenient to only have one pan to cook out of and like not have to worry too much about cleanup, right? So it's a cutting board and a pan. That's all you need. And a decent amount of fat because there's really not a whole lot. And sometimes you have to add a little bit more like throughout the cooking process so that your stuff doesn't get too dry. And this guy's pretty hot. So I like to kind of move it away from the, from the heat. It's gonna splatter. If you do that over the stove, it's gonna splatter the oil and the flame's gonna shoot up and then I catch on fire and then Andres owns the restaurant without me, which is not good. Um, he's a good cook, but he's not that great, you know? Um, so you can kind of see you've got like blistering going on in the pan there, like nice and caramelized. The tomato juice is popping. It's hitting the pan. It's reducing down. We're starting to build that flavor up. And then what we're going to do is just throw in some of the onions, most of those peppers, which are spicy. And I cut up the whole onion, but I'm looking at this pan and I'm thinking, I don't need to add more than that. Now the other part of this too is if you're building flavor in the pan, make sure you're seasoning every time you add something in, right? Um, I tell my cooks that all the time. It's super important, even when you're doing something simple as like sauteing some vegetables. So I'm gonna mix this around a little bit. And this stove is a beast. So we're getting really nice char and everything already, building up all that flavor. Adding salt every step of the way too is gonna start pulling water out of the vegetables so they cook faster. If you add salt and you season regularly, it's, it's helping you cook more efficiently as well. Um, so the other part of shakshuka that's kind of like my personal twist on it that I think is really fun is seasonally I'll change a vegetable that I like to throw in there as like an additional component. So like it's winter time, um, I like to use celery root or like potatoes. Um, I'll use potatoes like any time of the year if they're just kind of lying around. There's something about the creamy texture of like roasted root vegetables or like a squash that like that combination with like the crunch and snap of peppers and the tomato and like the, the egg yolk, like runniness and, and all that, like really just like elevates the dish to another level. And also if you just have like roasted vegetables lying around in your fridge, instead of like throwing them in an omelet, this is super easy to do as well. Um, so we had roasted off some celery root, just diced it up, seasoned it with salt, threw in a saute pan with some oil, and then cooled down. And I, I didn't want to cook it ahead of time because I wanted to explain to you that you can pre-roast things and use them as vegetable components in other dishes. Like you can just fold it in and it's just gonna enrich flavors. But for me in particular, it's all about that starchy, creamy texture. So you can see here, 
We've got some really beautiful color, because I um, was talking your ear off for like three minutes there about starchy vegetables. So the pan didn't, I didn't touch it. So now we can see there's a lot of flavor. Um, and at this point, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this like uh, poorly chopped garlic that I did um, and saute that just for a little bit. Uh, the one thing I think people do too often with garlic is, first of all, not use it enough, and two, like, overcook with it. Like, cook it for too long in sauteing. Like, sometimes I'll throw garlic in with onions if I'm, like, feeling kind of lazy. But if I can wait and then add it a little bit later to, like, right before I'm ready to kind of finish the saute process, maybe add stock, add tomatoes like we're gonna do. It keeps the spiciness of garlic present and gives you like an extra kick of like that sharp onion flavor. Um, and so garlic, then I'll add that celery root. Mix that all around. And then here comes the tomato. So you can see like tomato to vegetable ratio, pretty high on the vegetables. For me, that's more about what shakshuka is about. Like the tomato is a, a vessel to kind of bind everything together. And then I'm just kind of mixing and making sure everything's like super evened out. Now, at this stage, we've seasoned our celery root, right? Season all of our onions and peppers. Seasoning the tomato sauce. And now you've got something that's like seasoned all the way through. Now we're gonna let it reduce until it becomes like a custard. And this was on high, so I'm gonna turn it to like a low. And we're just gonna like hang out and chat for a minute, if that's okay. Do you guys have any questions about anything so far? Am I boring you to death? No. Am I funny? Is that a thing? Okay, cool. Yes. Hold up. Hold up. Oh, he's got the micro for you. You pureed the, the tomatoes, not the, not the cherry tomatoes. The oh, that balls. was just a can of crushed tomatoes. Okay. So like, you can get like San Marzano's crushed, mm -hmm. you can get Hunt's crushed. The whole thing is whatever type of tomato you want to use, just make sure you season them or check the can to see if it's already seasoned, because some of those Italian imported ones are pre-seasoned. Okay. Yep. You can also do, you can also buy whole peeled tomatoes, and you can just like put them in a bowl and like squish them, or like I use my hand, because I like to like really break them down. Um, I have friends from Ghana, so what's the um, difference between this food and? Sorry, what's that? I have friends from Ghana, so what would be the difference between the food you're cooking and what food they would so serve in Ghana? Uh, so I'm not that familiar with food from Ghana. I'm not even gonna act like I'm an expert on, on it. Um, I'm assuming fairly similar because in the continent, there's probably a lot of similar ingredients. I know a lot of like non-North African cuisine has a lot of like okra and rice as well. Um, so in the same realm, pretty similarly. The, I guess the main difference is that, from what I'm gonna assume, is a lot of the North African cuisine has a lot of like French um, like, and like uh, Spanish particularly influence because of like the Iberian Peninsula and like, or, like Morocco is so close. So a lot of Moroccan cuisine is where like there's a lot of trade and commerce and that kind of spread throughout. Um, a lot of food and like differences between cuisines. Like, have you taken world history yet, young lady? World history is a backdrop for all cuisine. Like anything you wanna know about where food came from originally, just follow where colonialization happened or like exchange of culture. So like Jewish cuisine is all over the world. There's Jewish Indian food, there's Jewish French food, there's Jewish Spanish. Jewish Russian, and that's because Jews have moved all over the world and then somehow all ended up in Israel. And so they like went everywhere and brought food. 
and then came back and brought food. Food is like a great um, bridge between cultures all the time. Anything else, guys? So uh, the shakshuka is getting there. You can see like here is still a little, little watery. Um, but uh, oh, I'm going to chop some herbs. Um, so parsley, cilantro, dill, three of my favorites. I cook with a lot of herbs. I like the freshness. Um, I like the combination. Uh, anybody not like cilantro? Not a fan? Don't like cilantro? Do you like it or don't like it? Oh, you like it. OK, we're cool. Um, I don't really chop it that often. Um, I'm just the kind of person that's just like a whole leaf of cilantro. Um, parsley, I think you do need to chop. Um, I can show you how. And then green onions. How many of you guys use the white part? You do? Like raw? You do? So in like, in like restaurants, like chefs don't let you use the white part. Um, so you're supposed to like, it's too sharp. So um, like one thing we could have done earlier is with the onions, if you were like opposed to the sharp oniony white part of the, of the scallion, you can cut it off, slice it super thin, and throw it in with the onions or with the garlic. Totally does the same thing. I'm really opposed to food waste. So like at the restaurant, we'll use tops for herbs that we slice up, and then we'll take, we'll take whites, and we'll throw them on charcoal grill, or throw them in our wood-fired pita oven, blacken them, toss them in like olive oil and salt, lemon juice, and use that as like a charred onion sauce on top of things. Um, or we'll throw it into stocks or whatever. But if you guys don't have a problem with it, I'm just going to throw them on there. I'm not afraid. Um, Anybody have any questions? Nothing? All right. So the shakshuka is getting there. Um, you can see it's not as jiggly, right? It's like not as watery. So in a second, what we'll be able to do is get those eggs in there, which is the other fun part and super delicate. It's my trash bowl. So we got some green onions. Pick some cilantro. Hey, Evelyn, do you want to pick some cilantro? Oh, great. This is my friend Evelyn, Hi. who did all the work for me ahead of time. So if you would please give her a round of applause, because she helped me out a lot today. Really appreciate it. Um, you yeah, just throw it on the cutting board. Oh, okay. That's fine. Um, all right, so final trick for shakshuka. You got your sauce, see how like, thick and solid it is? It's like not really moving that much. Um, most of that water is evaporated. It's like rich. The idea is you want to be able to like put a spoon in it and hold it up and it doesn't fall off the spoon, right? Because a lot of eating that's happening in the Middle East or North Africa is like they're using bread as a vessel, as a utensil. So we want to try and like, like replicate that. You know, hummus is one of those things like that texture is super important. Hummus that's too watery, you like can't scoop it. It's just going to fall off your pita. So same idea. So for me, the trick with the shakshuka is getting the right consistency. And then I like to make these like little divots. which are super fun. Because if I just drop the egg on top, it kind of spreads out. What I want to do is create like a poached egg. So I'm almost like doing like coddled eggs. You guys ever seen coddled eggs where they drop them in the little bowls and then poach the, poach the bowls in the water? Y'all are about to elevate your shakshuka game to a whole new level. You don't even know. 
and go home, make shakshuka good for your family. Where'd you learn that? Oh, just something I picked up somewhere. This guy that talked too much. Cool. So, none of the yolks broke. It's a good day. It's a good day. Um, so they, they are like doing their thing. They're hanging out. Um, you can use a lid or like for this purposes, out of pure convenience, I'm just gonna flip the pan over. There's water evaporating from the tomatoes. So that's coming up. If you put a lid on it, it does the same thing. I didn't ask Evelyn for a lid, so it's not my, it's my fault, it's not hers. But that's gonna steam the tops of the eggs, which is gonna help them cook. But they're still kind of like boiling inside of these little tomato like uh, trenches. And then in like a minute or so, pull that lid off, you'll see they're more cooked. And we want those yolks to be inside of like that white. And we want the yolks to be super runny. Personally, for me, I like a runny yolk. If you don't, you can overcook your eggs and your shakshuka and we're gonna be totally cool still. Um, and then we're gonna cover it in a ton of herbs, a bunch of harissa, and that's it. Pretty simple. Um, but uh, yeah, it's like that steaming process. That's gonna help expedite the process. You can, you can not do it, and it's totally fine. Um, but I prefer to, especially in a restaurant when you're trying to cook 16 shakshukas in five minutes, you kinda like need to put a lid on the pan, you know? Um, I'm really messy, huh? Cool. Uh, great. Um, We'll do a little uh, parsley chopping. How do you guys feel about that? Just a little parsley chopping? So, um, parsley I do like to chop finely. Um, I'm not one of those, you know, some of these chefs, they want you to put the leaves on top of each other and then really go slowly. Uh, you guys ever had tabbouleh before? So like my tabbouleh recipe is like mostly parsley. So you're talking about like, cutting up like gallons of parsley in a day for a restaurant. So you get like pretty fast at kind of chopping parsley really finely and doing it a lot of it. Um, so I like to kind of like roll it up, tuck it. Um, as long as the parsley is like fresh and it's not already kind of brown, when you slice it, it's not gonna turn brown. Make sure your knife's super sharp. And I tell my cooks this all the time too. Super important, don't go down on your herbs use the entire length of your blade. So like all the way across, cool. Um, the sharper your knife is, the easier, easier it's gonna be. I'm also I'm showing off, so I'm doing it kind of fast. Just kidding, this is how I am. Um, and you got some eggs, right? You can kind of see here a little bit too, guys. If it's hard to tell, but this is still a little runny, which is okay. It means we didn't overcook them, so it's great. But it might just be like 30 more seconds. But this is a game you kind of have to like pay attention to. You have a clear lid, fantastic. If you don't, just kind of regulate it a little bit. But you notice too, I haven't changed the temperature since we threw the tomato sauce in. I just let it keep going. And it's really not a lot to do. And once it's done, it's like enough to feed eight people for like one onion, one pepper, a head of garlic, like not a whole lot. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Not bad. Okay, so I also have a distaste for whites, like undercooked whites. I find them to be really gross. So I like to also really like kind of get in there and check to make sure I don't have any like very glaringly obvious whites that are hanging around.
think we seem to be OK, guys. Um, yeah, so the next step is garnish. Um, one thing I really, really, really stress for this dish, too, is making sure you actually season those eggs when they're finished. Because if someone gets like a kind of a bland egg and all this tomato, it's really not that appealing. I like to use sea salt. Um, kosher salt works great. But just a little bit on the top of each yolk before you finish with the garnish. Cool. And then um, don't forget, we have our, we have our handy dandy harissa. Nice and thin and spreadable. And I'm just going to drizzle it all the way around. Make sure I'm getting a lot of it on those eggs. And then um, just like a comical amount of herbs. Personal preference. If you don't like herbs, you don't have to. But I just like to just load it up. Bunch of our parsley. And whole sprigs of cilantro. Boom. That's it. Serve with a serving spoon. Put it a bunch of bread. Call it a day. Super simple. Uh, I probably made it seem more complicated than it needed to be, so I apologize. Like I said, I'm kind of a nerd, so it's fine. Um, anybody have any questions? Got one more. Some recipes ask that you put it in the oven to bake the eggs a little bit. What are your thoughts on? Um, I guess you can. I never saw the point in doing it because, like, I think that if you can use a lid, why would you want to turn your oven on? Just kind of eliminate an extra step. I'm like really into, like, I'm really into as a home cook at my house, not overcomplicating things. And as a chef, I can always figure out a way to like not do certain steps that a recipe gives me. So I'm more like interested in like one pot meals. I like doing that. I like roasting a bunch of Brussels sprouts, figuring out some sort of sauce and garnish. I'm like, that's a dish. Done. Super easy. I think people like tend to complicate recipes a lot. It gets tiring. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Chef Zachary Engel.